History is full of amazing stories and memorable people. But we don't care about them. No hits, deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. We are digging deep into the history books to bring you their stories. And maybe some laughs along the way. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is the Kazik of Poyes. So I, I want to start our conversation. We have a lot to cover today because uh, <laughs> our topic for today did a lot of different things. But I wanted to start off by getting your take on lying as a, as a moral issue. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think I am lie very often. I'm sure I say that and I'm like... <laughs> Oh yeah, I probably like stretch the truth about that or fibbed yeah. about this or whatever. So I I know it happens, but like I don't know. I try to be pretty honest with people and not really not even exaggerate more than necessary. Yeah, I mean that that leads well into my second point, which is is lying ever acceptable? Is it across the board just straight up wrong no matter what, or are there certain conditions that would make it the right thing to do? And if so, what are those connection? What are those conditions and also, where do you think lying begins versus embellishment or exaggeration? Or do you think they're all basically just degrees <laughs> of lying? <laughs> I mean, if you want to make it like a a moral, religious, philosophical type thing, like there is... I you always do. Look at the Ten Commandments, like thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Like lying is considered a sin. So yeah, I think it's morally wrong. I'm sure you can twist some way where you could justify lying right. for whatever reason to help your family or something like that but I, in general i just try to be a very honest person and you know i think anyone's upset when you find out that someone lied to you or right well i, I think in my experience like i probably have a more ambiguous view of it than you do <laughs> um just admitting that up front because i i do sometimes think that um if you can avoid harming somebody with dishonesty it's acceptable but that comes with a huge caveat and that in my belief in most cases you can't like you'll probably harm them more by being dishonest well you're just a compulsive liar so i don't think that's true you're just that's a little much that. that's a little much but you know i have i think i have been dishonest with people in in an attempt to smooth out especially social situations not in ginormous ways but you know, I, I do have a harder time just in, on a more innocent level being super upfront with how I'm feeling and, and thinking. Mm -hmm. And I'll openly admit that's led to a lot of, I think, over time friction. So I, I definitely envy, not envy, but agree with your, your view that like it's probably the best idea to just be completely I, out front and open. I think there's a definite difference between lying and embellishing or exaggerating though like when you mentioned those terms mm -hmm. like lying is in my opinion when you just straight up know you're being deceptive and saying something that is clearly blatantly not true whereas right. like obviously exaggeration is like there's some truth to it but you're maybe making it a little bit different or more dramatic than what it could be and right is it still lying yes to some degree but maybe there's ways that you could say it's not quite as bad sure I kind of, I mean, a little part of me wants to say, like, if you're having this conversation in your head, like, if you're questioning it's it, wrong. you're, yeah, right. <laughs> if you're trying to justify it to yourself, you're if probably you're like, in the is wrong. this the right thing to do? It's not. It's really not that bad, you know. <laughs> Just a little white lie. But the reason I wanted to talk about these, and usually we have longer discussions at the beginning of episodes, but I found over the course of researching this gentleman that there's so much there that I want to get into. And I think we can have a lot of interesting conversations, but the reason I wanted to start this way is because he kind of does all three of what we've discussed. He lies, he embellishes, he exaggerates. And most of the time it's pretty much for his own gain, if not a hundred percent of the time for <laughs> his own gain. But without further ado, our topic for today is going to be Gregor McGregor, who was a Scottish soldier and explorer and in the end, confidence man that pretty much pulled off the most bold, brazen confidence scheme of the 19th century. But I want to start a little bit with how 
his life began. So Gregor McGregor was born on Christmas Eve, 1786 in Scotland. Gregor McGregor already sounds like a fake name. <laughs> I've read it so many times over the past four days that like it's not funny to me anymore. But when I first started researching it, I was like, who, why did you name your kid this? Like we, we know obviously from our discussion at the start of this that he's going to be a liar. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gregor McGregor. <laughs> nope, you're lying. That's a fake name. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's like, I'm Donald O'Donnell. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, I don't know what naming... The, not themes. I don't know what naming trends were in Scotland in the late 1700s, but his name is definitely ridiculous. Yeah. So he was born to Daniel and Anne McGregor. And Daniel, his father, was an East India Company sea captain. So for those who don't know or aren't familiar, the East India Company was one of the biggest merchant companies in the 1700s. They actually, at one point at their peak, ac- accounted for half of the world's trade half (laughs) like there's no company today that accounts for that so enormously successful his family was roman catholic and was part of the clan gregor uh, whose origins date back to the 1800s and were one of the first in scotland to begin playing the bagpipes which has no relevancy to this story but (laughs) i just thought was interesting but these clans were basically just hereditary familial lines in scotland Not much is known about his early childhood. Uh, We do know that his father died in 1794, and he and his two sisters were primarily raised by their mother. Gregor later claimed to have attended the University of Edinburgh from 1802 to 1803, but there aren't really records of his attendance there. Now, before we start distrusting everything this man did, (laughs) this, this could have actually happened. The main reason that records might not exist is because he didn't finish a degree. Um, And some biographers think that this part of the story could be true just due to his level of sophistication and also his mother's several connections in the city of Edinburgh. Just rule of thumb. We're going to assume that everything about him is a lie. (laughs) None of this episode is true. It's when we get further on, it might not be a bad idea. McGregor ends up joining the British army at 16 in 1803. And this was the youngest age at which you could join the British army. And his family purchased him a commission as an ensign in the 57th Regiment of Foot for about 450 pounds. What does that mean, like purchased him a commission? So in the army at this time, in the British army at this time, you could just join the army. Um, I don't remember what they were called, but you could join as like the entry level soldier and work up to officer ranks. Or if your family was wealthy and had the money, you could purchase officer ranks. (laughs) So... You know, it was a way of the for the army and the military to raise money, um, and it allowed. You got a bunch of preppy rich kids, right? I mean, <laughs> military generals. It, 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 it also, I mean, it encouraged richer families to enter their sons into the military, and it it basically allowed you to forego all the work and and accomplishments and you know experience you would need mm-hmm. to get to these ranks, and that's something that McGregor didn't stop doing here. But before we get to that, once he was in the the military in the 57th Regiment, he ended up meeting a woman by the name of Maria Bowater in 1804. Now, coincidentally, we don't know this is why he married her, but her father was an admiral in the Royal Navy, and she commanded a pretty substantial dowry. Uh, she was related to two generals, a member of parliament, and the famous botanist, Almer Bork Lambert. So a lot of connections, I think, Given his background, this certainly raised his social standing. No, I ain't saying he a gold digger. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's if this was alone, the only thing he did that was a little bit weird in the realm of like improving his social stance, I could buy that he just genuinely liked her. And maybe he did. But this is just one piece of a long string, just a theme of doing odd things to <laughs> improve his social status. But nonetheless, McGregor and Maria married in 1805 in Westminster and set up residence in London at the home of Maria's aunt. And following his marriage, he then rejoined the 57th Regiment, where he promptly purchased the rank of captain for 900 pounds, now having the dowry and (laughs) Maria's family's money to do it. And this basically allowed him to forego the seven years of hard work it took to achieve such a promotion. So he gets this windfall and purchases the rank of captain. I don't want to make any assumptions about him because obviously we're going back in history and like right 
hindsight is twenty twenty or whatever, but it kind of seems like he never really worked for much. Like he was able to buy or be given pretty much all of his accomplishes thus far. Yeah, I mean, as we go on, this, I mean, everything that, almost everything he does supports that viewpoint. And so while it might seem like you're jumping to a conclusion, I think it's probably true. I mean, he does a lot of things that, to me at least, make me think he was more about a surface level, kind of vain level of respect and admiration than one who really wanted to put in the work and like do their craft for the sake of doing the craft made him feel important yeah exactly yeah i mean he i don't know who else to compare him to but he he just has this almost familiar air of like he was all about show he was about marketing that's i mean (laughs) that's it he like he he marketed he was a pr guy for himself and he was able to make himself look far better in reality than I think he deserved. I mean, he, you know, we could say he was one of the greatest personal marketing people of this century. Cause it's almost like growing accustomed to a certain standard of living and then you shoot for higher aspirations. So rather than working hard and building up your brand, you just run for president one day and get in you know solely <laughs> on your name value. I want, I'm sorry. I wanted to make that comparison so bad, but I refused because I know we've made it so many times, but I could not stop thinking of that <laughs> individual. Uh, when I was reading about him, because he he did a lot of that. He did that like surface level. It's about the show. It's about what it looks like. It's not about what it is. It's about what it looks like. But to get back to the the story, so he purchases his rank of captain, foregoes the seven years of hard work, um, and after this, it's noted that McGregor develops this obsession with rank insignia, dress, and medals. Not going to mention the afor- aforementioned <laughs> comparison, but he basically becomes obsessed with this rank and superiority and he actually ends up forbidding any enlisted man or non-commissioned officer beneath him to leave their quarters in less than full uniform and was pretty unpopular as a result of that. He was the 57th regiment's best dressed (laughs) one that superlative same one you did. I don't think I won it for the same reasons, (laughs) but you were always in high school in your (laughs) military dress blues and all your awards. That's sorry, exactly your, your what band I wore. awards. <laughs> so that's exactly what I wore. But I mean, I, I to, to compare it to high school, it's kind of like wearing your Letterman's jacket with the pins and, and yeah. letters and insisting that everyone else beneath you also wear theirs and treat you as such. I was going to say like insisting the entire football team wears theirs, <laughs> but they do already. But unfortunately for him, in 1809, after a disagreement with a superior officer, which led to his demotion, McGregor was eventually forced to request discharge, which he was promptly granted. Uh, He ended up retiring from service in May of 1810, receiving back the 1,350 pounds he had paid for his ranks and returning to Britain. So we got a refund after? (laughs) Yeah, basically. I don't know what they did with this money, if they invested it and got a a return on it. But it's kind of funny to me that it got refunded entirely after a discharge. I mean, it wasn't necessarily dishonorable, but... You know, as we talk about later, he he did it in such a way that he wasn't really able to return to the military. Mm-hmm. So, I don't I don't know the military customs at the time. Just after his discharge, the fifty seventh regiment's actions during the Battle of Albuera and the Peninsulan Wars earned it much prestige and the nickname the Diehards. Now, despite having left the regiment prior to these accomplishments, McGregor would later associate himself with them. For his benefit. Of course. Yeah. After his discharge, he and his wife moved to Edinburgh and later London, all the while assuming questionable nobility titles such as colonel and baronet in an attempt to display an air of respectability. He also traveled in a flamboyant and ornate colorful coach. So this is where I really started to make the comparison you made because I'm like, he's like the whole time he's just trying to display an air of nobility, a display, an air of wealth. Was the entire coach gold plated? <laughs> I don't know if it was gold plated, but it was definitely, I mean, pe- it was mentioned several places that it was very flamboyant. It was very right. colorful. It was meant to display wealth and, and respectability. And he even went as far as trying to claim his relation to a number of dukes and barons. And there's this entire, it's actually really interesting. There's an entire list of like 15 different levels of nobility and while he usually used the lower ones, he still tried to claim connection to upper ones, even going as far as to claim that his Scottish heritage dated back to 
nobility in Scotland. So he's kind of like trying to claim his importance without yeah. seeming in a way that's almost too unbelievable. Like, right. I'm very top tier. I'm important. But I'm not going to say I'm the king of England, otherwise you're not going to believe me. Right. I mean, I think he towed a, a good line there. And, and a number of people did buy that he was part of the nobility. And he'd gained some degree of respectability, though, usually never to his satisfaction. Mm-hmm. And it is worth mentioning, this is at a different time than today, where like today, if you really wanted, I think, if you really had the desire to ascend into the elite classes of America and worked hard enough, I think it would be achievable. Like it, you would have to make sacrifices for right. sure. And I mean, it would have to become a major priority, but it's not like we have a class system like back then where it like if you're hereditarily outside of a box. You weren't able to basically transcend different right. levels. He's traveling around Britain, attending these parties, traveling in a flamboyant coach, trying to display his money after the sudden death of his wife, Maria in 1811 though, he was basically left without money, support, or any viable professional opportunities. A lot of his money came from her family. He couldn't, you know, marry another woman immediately because then they would come out in public protest and they had a lot of influence. He couldn't go back to the military, which was basically his only experience. So he ended up deciding to travel to Venezuela, hoping that his exotic adventures and involvement in their fight for independence of the day would gain him favor in London's social elite. And this came from a pretty specific influence. He had noted the celebrity and grand treatment of the Venezuelan revolutionary General Francisco de Miranda during his visit to London. This man had come and he had watched how he was treated among the nobility. And so he kind of decided, you know, why don't I go there and try this? I'll have all these exotic stories. Mm -hmm. Being a former British officer and member of the diehards, upon his arrival in Venezuela, he was accepted immediately into the army. Shortly thereafter, he again married, this time to a woman named Donna Josefa Antonia Andrea Aristeguieta y Lovera. Josefa for short. <laughs> You're getting really good at these pronunciations. I practiced that a lot. That was Her name's six words long. I mean... <laughs> I'm like, I know we've been doing a lot of American topics, and I'm like afraid to do these international ones because I'm so bad at <laughs> foreign pronunciations. That one wasn't so bad. It just took... A couple a little bit of practice and i still kind of stumbled through it so josefa is is her name for the rest of the episode <laughs> his time in venezuela in the military was marked by a handful of victories against a backdrop of failed but pretty theatrical attempts at glory <laughs> not surprised his most successful feat was a 34-day march through enemy spanish territory so in the day venezuela and new granada which is now Colombia, were fighting for independence from Spanish control. So Spain is basically the royalist enemy here. So he leads his 34-day march through enemy Spanish territory, where he brings his men to safety while being pursued by two separate Spanish armies on his way to the revolutionary-controlled Barcelona in eastern Venezuela. And this feat, which is known as the Barcelona March, basically became legendary among Latin American revolutionary lore. I mean, he's even today sometimes discussed. So this brought him a lot of that glory he was looking for and kind of solidified him as a military leader there. Hmm. It's also worth mentioning that he was already popular on the surface level because of his European military training. Many of the armies here were made up of natives and kind of backcountry colonist fighters. Similar, I mean, not unlike the American Revolution where you had a lot of guerrilla groups Uh, And he brought this level of discipline and organization that wasn't really widespread at the time. So he did display an air of, I guess, militaristic know-how. Unfortunately, his reputation was a bit marred in part by several questionable military quests in which he would announce an enormously bold, almost larger-than-life plan of attack. And this happened multiple times, such as taking back Florida from Spain or single-handedly liberating New Grenada. And after attracting investment and raising troops with these bold claims, he would largely squander both the money and the troops. <laughs> and and it it's not quite clear how he squandered it. He just wasn't, I think, good at understanding that making all these claims would lead to the responsibility of completing them. And usually unable to pay his troops what he promised them at the beginning of the quest or whatever it may be, he would end up paying them, quote unquote, 
with these invented ranks and titles, even going so far as to create his own chivalric order, the Knights of the Green Cross. So instead of paying you the, whatever, 100 pounds that I offered you to go on this, I'd be like, oh, no, you're going to be a, I don't know, colonel in my chivalric order. That's fair. I mean, <laughs> it makes them seem important. That's what he wants out of it. I this. mean, at this day, it, it certainly means more, meant more back then than I think it would today. I'm just this, kidding. You can't. Well, I get it. A I am under- title for dinner. I understand <laughs> you what you're feed saying. Your family with but military it, ranks. It definitely meant more back then than I think it would today cuz yeah. you really were afforded more opportunities as a higher rank. But it's still kind of I mean it's still definitely shoddy payment at best. That's how I pay you to be on this podcast with me. I say, "Hey Matt, do you want to be my executive producer and co-host?" And I put it on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> I lie about what we take in, though. I say I'm the executive producer of a multi-million dollar podcast publishing company. We don't have multi-million dollars. Please support the podcast and <laughs> buy me a coffee. So, upon failure, usually, of these quests, his MO was to blame anyone else for his failure or make excuses or to embellish the retelling of these quests to make him seem like a hero in the aftermath. He makes these bold claims, he basically fails at delivering, and then he in some way lies or bends the truth in order to make it seem less embarrassing than it was. And I am, fair admission, glossing over a lot of details here for the sake of getting to the con, because there's so much information, but I definitely encourage you to go look into his military exploits beforehand, because he does a lot of weird stuff. (laughs) The two things that he does in particular that I can remember, at one point during a battle, after another group had basically won the battle, he lands on shore and like stomps up and boldly de- declares that there's victory for his troops. And he basically like walks into the battlefield that he didn't even participate in and then declares victory for him and his troops. And on another occasion, he ended up stranding part of his, his army on a beach to be captured by the Spanish. One of whom actually ended up his brother ended up writing a book about him, a scathing book about him that was sent back to Britain, but unfortunately didn't become popular enough to <laughs> ruin his reputation. But he did a lot of pretty off color stuff as a military leader, but somehow was able to always kind of slide by as this respected hero. Yeah. I think the important thing to remember for this episode is that with, with his military backing, he's just kind of this guy who promises a lot and doesn't deliver. Yeah. And just that, status is very important to him like he he's trying to give off this air of being important and influential and a big leader Mm -hmm. but he doesn't really follow through on what he's promising yeah and and to use a direct anecdote it i think the biggest priority to him was to be able to go to these dinner parties with british nobility and retell of his grandiose (laughs) exploits like he did that he he would you know go to dinner parties that he was invited to as a war hero and then told tell these really embellished stories about his heroic feats but a lot of people in the army with him kind of doubted him saw him as a bluffer or or fraud and this string of failed military exploits went well into 1819 so he was there in venezuela for eight or nine years participating in all of these different ventures But in October of 1819, he suddenly disappears from any historical record for about six months. (laughs) And he ends up reappearing. But before we get to that, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Matt, you like coffee, right? I love coffee. Would you ever want to buy me a coffee? Anytime, Phil. Just say the word. You know, our dedicated listeners could also buy me a coffee. Could they buy me a coffee as well? They could buy you a coffee. This sounds fantastic. We set up this service called Buy Me a Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. And people can buy us a coffee? Yeah. It's really just a way for people to support the show if they enjoy the show. And if they're listening to the show, we sure hope you enjoy it. Yeah, otherwise you're just, I mean, wasting your time. At buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side, there's three ways that our listeners can interact with the show. Number one, you can just donate to the show by clicking buy them a coffee. 
Two, you can join as a member for $10 a month or $100 a year. Being a member gains you some pretty cool perks. You get access to our monthly bonus episode, History's B-Side Battles, access to our future episode queue, a name shout out on a future episode. We'll also send you a handwritten thank you postcard and sticker set, and more perks will be announced as we continue on. There's also some different extras that people can get on our Buy Me A Coffee website. Things like choosing the topic for a future episode. If there's a person, lesser known person in history that you have an interest in, let us know and we'll do an episode all about them. You can also buy sets of custom postcards, sticker sets, and future merchandise that we add on there as well. Or you can draft your own advertisement script and we will promote whatever you want in a segment like this. The website again is buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. Matt? Yeah? You owe me a coffee. Oh. Do I get a coffee too? You're buying. All right. All right, welcome back. So we left off with him disappearing for essentially a six-month period in Latin America, uh, and he reappears in April of 1820 in the court of King George Frederick Augustus of the Mosquito Coast. Now, if that sounds exotic to you, it should, because I've never heard of it. Mosquitoes are exotic. (laughs) I'm going to say Mosquito Coast so many times that we're just going to have to get used to it, but it sounds so funny to me given what we know mosquitoes to be, and I don't know if they were named for this area or the opposite, but... The Mosquito Coast is basically the eastern coast of Latin America, of Central America, which stretches from the Honduran coast to Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Present day Nicaragua. And I'm not I'm not (laughs) even gonna try to pronounce it. (laughs) So it's this very tropical land, and at the time it wasn't really well developed. The Mosquito people were descended from shipwrecked African slaves and indigenous peoples, and the British authorities in the region granted the title king to their most powerful chieftains simply to obstruct Spanish claims on the land. So the title king in Central and Latin America for the British had little meaning in terms of power or control. They were basically just place. It was almost like saving a seat. They were like, oh, we have a king there. You can't claim it. So the king actually had some authority in the area. A it wasn't little just bit. like a... But he certainly wouldn't have been know. akin to like king. A the label king of given just to say they had a king. A little bit. I mean, he certainly ruled as the. I mean, I think he had a similar role to like what a governor in the Americas would have had. Okay. So he ruled over this plot of land, and he basically was the head figure. But he still had to report to a British, a government. British somebody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this king George Frederick Augustus. Uh, has McGregor in his court, and he ends up signing a document granting McGregor and his heirs 8 million acres of mosquito land in exchange for rum and jewelry. This is bigger than the country of Wales. That's a um, good trade. Just it's a rum and huge jewelry. amount of... <laughs> I know. Like, I want to know how much rum and jewelry, but he grants him all of this land. And this plot of land sits on the eastern coastal region of present-day Honduras, uh, just north of the Nicaraguan border, and it's really aesthetically beautiful. It's tropical. It's jungle. But it's basically useless for farming or raising of livestock. And that becomes important. <laughs> McGregor ends up dubbing this land Poyes and soon appears back in London calling himself the Cazique of Poyes. Cazique is a Spanish American word for chief. And he claims the king gave him this title, though the title and Poyes, the country, were basically of his own invention. The only thing he has at this point is the ownership of the land. Where does the name Poyes come from? It was named for an indigenous people, the the Paya, that lived in the highlands above the the coastal regions in like in this area or just yeah. nearby. Um, nearby, they might have lived in the same area. I don't okay. know for sure where their boundaries stopped. I do imagine that they probably lived in the eight million acres he was given, but. <laughs> I don't know for sure. But he goes back to London and, and starts calling himself the Kazik of Paez. And in, in Britain, people had little knowledge of McGregor's failures over the past few years in the Caribbean and Latin America. And they basically only remembered his famous march to Barcelona and his connection to the diehards, the aforementioned diehards. 
Um, at this point, people had either never found out about or forgotten his dischargement from the military. And in a volatile climate like Latin America, it seemed plausible that a new country such as Poyes might have come into existence under the rule of a decorated general such as McGregor. There were revolutions all the time. You know, the Spanish were fighting f- for control with natives, with other colonists. So there was a lot of exchange of land. There's a lot of exchange of government here. So it didn't seem insane. It wouldn't be like today where somebody just popped up on the eastern coast of Australia, like, there's a new country yeah. here. Um, and, you know, McGregor was a decorated general and had participated down there. And it was a time where that could plausibly happen. So people believed it. The McGregors became very appealing, exotic adornments for dinners and social events of sophisticated London. And his wife, Josepha, even appeared as the princess of Poyet's. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm imagining that Gregor loved this. It was exactly what he wanted. Like, he was the Kazik. The, the Kazik. He was the prince of Poyet's. He sounds had like a country. Disney movie. It really does. <laughs> the princess of Poyet's. <laughs> he, it sounds like a novel. <laughs> He claims he returned to London to add a little bit of legitimacy to his position. He claimed he returned to London to attend King George IV's coronation on behalf of the country of Poyes and to seek investment and immigrants for the new country. He claimed to have formed a democratic government there and even presented an invented document proclaiming his intention to travel to Britain with the purpose of gathering investors and colonists, claiming he distributed this proclamation to his citizens. In Poyes. Of course, no such distribution was made on the Mosquito Coast. So did Poyes actually have any citizens or like was it just him and Josepha? Like did did any indigenous native people actually live in this yeah. area? I imagine they did. I don't know for sure. I didn't read anything specifically stating that they did, but I think this is akin to like owning land in a state. Like you don't get to own land in Ohio and say you decided to make your own country out of the land. There's probably a story somewhere of that actually happening. I probably. Where someone, I'm sure there's a story yeah. where someone tried to set up their own independent country within the United States. Right. And But he basically does something akin to that. So I'm sure there were native people living on the land. There might have been British colonists living on the land. It was a big swath of land. And it was still theoretically under control of this King Augustus from the Mosquito Coast, the Mosquito King. So I imagine people were living there. Thus, he begins one of the most brazen cons in history. He went so far. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here that he did that I can't. It's kind of incredible. He fabricated a constitution and a parliament structure for the new country, drew up commercial and banking systems, and even designed a distinctive uniform for each rank of the Poyer military. He created land titles, a coat of arms, and an honor system. And unsurprisingly, used the same green cross flag he used for his invented chivalric order. I mean, this is a lot of work. Like, <laughs> It's an enormous amount of work. This is like someone's, I don't know, fantasy online RPG Yeah, it's a really intense RPG. Thing, but like <laughs> before there was the internet, right. and this guy just made up his entire fantasy country right. yeah, and I made spend himself like, the king of it. I've played some video games where you have to like create your own custom character, and I spent three hours deciding that. <laughs> I don't know how you decide an entire government and country. Just write a constitution <laughs> for fun. So yeah, he does all of this to make it look like a legitimate country. And McGregor ends up setting up offices in London, Edinburgh, and Glasgow to sell land certificates to prospective emigrants. He develops an aggressive marketing campaign, giving interviews in national newspapers, publishing ads and leaflets about Poyers, and even having ballads about the country composed and sung in the streets of London. I mean, that's even a lot of work (laughs) in the other countries. Like, that's not even just making your own country look like real, but you're actually spending a lot of money to advertise something that doesn't exist yeah where did he get this money well i don't i mean i I don't know if he had it up front but we'll get to the reason why in a second because he stood to make a lot of money the finances of of poye yeah in addition to these in mid 1822 a 355 page guidebook for settlers (laughs) to the country appeared assumingly written by mcgregor which was titled The Sketch of the Mosquito Shore, Including the Territory of Poyes. 
This is so ridiculous. <laughs> it gets so much worse. The guidebook went so far as to claim that the rivers in Poyais contain globules of gold, that farmland was so fertile as to allow three harvests per year, and that fish and game were so plentiful that one day's hunt could feed a family for a whole week. The guidebook forecasted profits into the millions for colonists. The most ridiculous part of it is that it stated that natives were not only cooperative, but enthusiastically pro-British. I'm sure they were. <laughs> Who doesn't love the colonizers? It also outlined a description of St. Joseph, the seaside Poyer's capital, which had wide paved boulevards lined with mansions, a theater, an opera house, a domed cathedral, and a royal palace. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know we're about to get into like the con part of this. Where he lied. About, well, obviously, we're already talking about him lying about all this stuff, and like people are inevitably going yeah, to fall for it. It's still jungle. It's but just like, jungle. <laughs> people are dumb. <laughs> if you believe that there's a country in the world that is this beautiful, shining paradise. Well, if you think about the times, like not to justify all of it, but people were hoping and traveling to the new world with the hope of finding this. Like they this truly believed. Eden of That's life. This was like. Yeah. The and ocean. so. People all like constantly crossing their fingers, whether it was in America or in California. I'm not California wasn't America, but the California gold rush. People hope to go there and get yeah. rich on all of this. And same with Latin America. I and guess we're looking from a <laughs> biased perspective where we know pretty much what the rest of the world looks <laughs> yeah, like. We knew what a dump it was. here. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, people were hoping for this and he was like, no, it's here. I found it. <laughs> so now comes the part where he starts to make a buttload of money off of this. So alongside his land grants, McGregor issued a Poyasian government loan on the London Stock Exchange with bonds in denominations of 100, 200, and 500 pounds. Now, this wasn't unheard of. There were lots of Latin American countries that were emerging, primarily Chile, Peru, and a handful of others that were selling bonds. So this was pretty popular, and it was essentially a government loan for those of you who don't understand bonds. I don't understand bonds fully, but it's basically the same way a stock would be to a company, a bond is to a government. So it's the government borrowing your money at an interest rate and theoretically you get your money back. Now, these were a lot riskier and we'll get to why in a moment. The timing of McGregor's scheme was perfect. The interest rates were low and the British government bond, so the bond, the money borrowed from the British government was listed at 3% return annually, which wasn't a huge return, but was doing something for investors. Uh, but those wishing to make a riskier investment turned abroad to those bonds that were budding in Latin American countries. So they ended up being, just because they were riskier investments, the countries weren't as solidified as Britain, their annual returns were closer to 6%. And they were growing too. Like Britain was already established. It's not like it was going to explode. Like I said, there were a lot of people hoping these Latin American countries would end up to be these like hugely successful empires. So lending money was riskier, but gave you a higher percent. So people were really interested in it. And for McGregor, if the issue of his bonds followed the course of other legitimate South American countries like Peru, Chile, Gran Colombia, he would amass a fortune in bond sales. I mean, it, it, he stood to make a lot of money, which would have made paying for the marketing and all right. this other crazy stuff a drop in the bucket. To legitimize these bond sales, he began recruiting immigrants, focusing first on Scottish citizens as he believed they'd trust him more due to his Scottish heritage. And this bolstered the trust in the bond in two ways. First, they saw emigration as a sign of the legitimacy of the country, as well as the legitimacy of the intentions of developing the land and providing eventual financial returns. So and I get the benefit of selling the bonds, and I, I understand promoting emigration to sell the bonds but like that's where you lose me in the scheme because it's one thing to have the bonds and turn it into mm -hmm. a whole thing where you're taking people's money and using it to pay out right. investments and things like that but once you convince people to move to this country that doesn't exist right that's where you're gonna get caught well i think i don't know a lot about the economic model of the day i do think if you for a moment eschew your empathy for human beings <laughs> and those who would board these ships to go to this jungle wasteland. He stood to make 
a lot more money because these immigrants, these emigrants would make the bond seem more attractive, would make it seem more legitimate, more people would buy it, its value would rise. So I don't know how much he stood to make with or without them, but nonetheless, he made the decision to try to make the country. And a lot of historians say that it's possible that he lied so much about this that he truly ended up believing that he was actually going to have this country with people immigrating to it and colonists and, you know, truly believed if he could get some people there, he could develop the land and have this country of Poyais that he had completely fabricated. Yeah. If you repeat something to yourself enough times, you yeah. start to believe that it's real and yeah, absolutely buy into it. When this isn't even the first time, this is just the biggest, this isn't the first time he's, lied well to yeah make himself look better so sure he always thought he was a supreme yeah. military general <laughs> and great leader i am incredible just nobody sees it <laughs> <laughs> so regardless of whether it was a good idea or not hundreds of emigrants end up signing up enough to fill seven ships and these emigrants include bankers doctors skilled artisans young men who had bought commissions in the poyasian military oh, civil servants farmers and even in Edinburgh cobbler who accepted a position as the official shoemaker of the Princess of Poyais. <laughs> this poor guy was like, this is my big break. He ends up, I don't want to, I'll talk about him in a minute because okay. it's, it's kind of sad. So upon their departure in these ships, the first two ships that left, McGregor sells Bank of Poyais dollar notes in exchange for gold and pounds sterling. So maybe this is another reason to have emigrants because now you're getting all of this money from them for this fake dollar so is this whole strategy here just the idea that the people who do want to go to the country will eventually realize it's a lie but at that point it'll be too much trouble for them to go back home like once they realize they're in a barren jungle it'll be too difficult for them to go back home and he won't actually get in trouble for it and then the ones who don't want to go across the ocean will just continue to invest in it because they don't know any better and then by the time that they realize that it's wrong, he'll be out of the country and too far away that he won't actually face any trouble for it. I don't know. I mean, not to spoil a lot, but he ends up not having to face all that many consequences. And I don't know his game plan. And Maybe it's not didn't written have about. an exit strategy. <laughs> I don't... I, it, it almost seems like he was just making stuff up as he went, not really realizing what the consequences might be. Because... He never says and he never does anything about mm -hmm. the the settlers that end up going there. And it, there's no indication of what he plans to do to get out of this. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I assume fleeing was on his mind. But I do think on some level he still he, he lied so thoroughly that he started to believe that they were like, I don't know if he was this delusional, but I think he started to believe that they were going to arrive to the, the beautiful city of Poyais <laughs> or city of St. Joseph in Poyais. Like We'll figure it out when we get there. <laughs> But this is a big moment. This is where his scheme goes from being a financial hoax to a deadly act. Like, he goes from being a white-collar criminal to arguably a murderer. Yeah. I mean, he these people end up perishing in some ways. So the first ship, Honduras Packet, I also love these ship names, <laughs> Honduras Packet arrives in what was supposed to be Poyais in November of 1822. And upon arrival... They found the country vastly different from that described in the sketch. Uh, no sign of St. Joseph. Emigrants assumed that they'd be contacted by Poyasian authorities. I mean, you know what? Have you watched the Fire Festival documentary? Mm -mm. This reminds me of that. So as quickly as I can say this, and spoiler alerts for the Fire Festival thing, I can't remember his name. It's something McFarland. Billy McFarland was this concert promoter who was able to, like, build this fire festival it's supposed to be like this amazing yeah I, I remember thing. like the news stories yeah but... and he had all of these instagram posts like bella hadid and other models had posted about fire festival he was friends with jaw rule which gave him some sort of credibility and he hyped this thing up to be like the festival of the century and people got there and it was literally just tents in the sand <laughs> with packed sandwich lunches and like it was nothing like he had described. So it almost reminds me of this. Those people probably didn't perish on the beach. <laughs> well, to be fair, I don't think Poyais even had the tents and the same yeah, right? packed sandwiches. So they end up sending numerous search parties inland, one of which found St. Joseph with the help of a local guide who recognized the name. St. Joseph was the site of ruins, long forgotten rubble. No grandiose city. 
I mean, what did McGregor expect to happen when these people got there? I don't know. I don't know if he like hoped they died and just nobody found <laughs> out. Like, I truly don't. It's it's kind of incredible that he had the I don't know hubris to go through with this. <laughs> Ex-British officer Hector Hall. Oh, that's my great, 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 great grandfather. Oh, is it? Yeah. He was British? We go way back. Yeah, oh. I got his portrait in our house. <laughs> so Hector Hall was a commissioned lieutenant colonel of the Poyasian 2nd Native Regiment of Foot, who was put in charge of the Honduras packet. And privately, he realized that McGregor had duped them. But he avoided admitting this to the others, fearing the loss of morale and chaos among the stranded settlers. So he basically realizes we've been tricked, but he doesn't want to say it. A few weeks pass, and the captain of the Honduras packet abruptly sails away to escape a storm. <laughs> this is so, it's so absurd. Essentially stranding the colonists. There's no good characters in this story. No. <laughs> it gets worse. Comforting the settlers with vague assurances, Hector Hall sets out to find the Mosquito King, hoping to secure another ship. In the meantime, the second ship, Kinnersley Castle, disembarks in March of 1823. Their optimism quickly destroyed as they see the reality before them. Hall returns in April with the disheartening news that he could find no ship and that King George Frederick Augustus, having not been aware of their presence, was far from considering them his responsibility. To be fair, they weren't really his responsibility. <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> Despite being well supplied and having two doctors in their midst, the rainy season brings insects and malaria and yellow fever begin to take hold. The settlers fall into despair. They eventually end up being discovered by a ship traveling from British Honduras, which is present day Belize, to the Mosquito Coast, carrying the chief magistrate of Belize to the Mosquito King's court. The magistrate informs the people that Poyes didn't exist and that he had never heard of this cazique they spoke of. He advises them to return with him to British Honduras, insisting that if they don't, many of them will die. But a lot of them chose to stay and await the return of Hector Hall, who had traveled again to the Mosquito King's court. Eventually, Hall returns with the king, who promptly revokes McGregor's land grant and informs the settlers that they are there illegally <laughs> and would have to leave unless they pledged allegiance. <laughs> I can't even read it. It's too funny. It's so ridiculous. And said that they would have to leave unless they pledged allegiance to them. So, <laughs> the Mosquito King is clearly, like, in some kind of position of authority here. Like, we, earlier we yeah. were talked about, we weren't really sure. But I also, unrelated, think that's funny that, like, a few <laughs> weeks ago we talked about the Mountain Troll King, and now we're talking about the Mosquito, mosquito King. Mosquito King. <laughs> Which sounds like he's the king of the mosquitoes, but This whole no. thing could be a storybook. It's, an, it's absurd. <laughs> so, in response to the king's wishes... All the settlers left for British Honduras, save for 40 who were too sick or weak to travel. They, I suppose, pledged allegiance to the Mosquito <laughs> King. <laughs> I guess. Unfortunately, the weather in British Honduras was worse than on the Mosquito Coast, and many were in bad shape after the trip, which took three separate trips. Most of the settlers ended up dying from their diseases. And now McGregor's a murderer. Yep. <laughs> the colony superintendent sends word to Britain of the imaginary state of Poyais. By the time the message reaches its destination, McGregor already had five more ships on the way, which were intercepted by the Royal Navy. What is he doing? Like, <laughs> he knows this he isn't going to work. <laughs> it's like a Hail Mary Come on, pass. everyone get on a boat. Get over there. <laughs> Come on. If enough people land on the beach, it'll end up a country, right? Yeah, and then he's going to go home and triumphantly return to his people who he just stranded in a jungle. <laughs> for him to a tree and yeah. kill him. <laughs> So, two other ships ended up actually making it all the way to Poyais. One with 105 passengers and another with just supplies on board. Both see the abandoned settlement and continue on to disembark in Belize. The surviving colonists in Latin America either remain in British Honduras, settle in the United States, or return to Britain aboard the British vessel, the Ocean. Of the 250 who sailed on the first two ships... 180 perished Jeez. and fewer than 50 ever returned to Britain. Jeez. In classic con man style, McGregor leaves London shortly before the small party aboard the ocean returns, <laughs> claiming he was taking Josepha to Italy for the winter. He actually went to Paris. 
The London press had gotten wind of the scandal and reported extensively on McGregor's fraud and the harrowing experiences of the settlers. Despite all of this, and this is the part that blows my mind the most, despite all of this, six survivors, six of the 50 that returned to Britain, signed affidavits stating that their blame lay not with McGregor, but with Hector Hall, saying, we believe that Sir Gregor McGregor has been worse used by Colonel Hall and his other agents than was ever a man before, they declared, and that had they have done their duty by Sir Gregor and by us, things would have turned out very different at Poyers. First of all, what? <laughs> My great 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 grandfather was framed. Innocent. Clearly. The Hall name needs to be redeemed here. Second of all, how is any of this his fault? Like how do they I even come up with that idea? It's truly baffling to me. I think part of it, and I don't know how big a part of it, but part of it was that Gregor was really good at manipulating people. I think he did a, such a good job of convincing people of the truth of his story that they had a hard time believing that it was a lie. So, like, okay, <laughs> McGregor's out of town at this point. He's not the one they're convincing them. Yeah, like, he's in Paris. That it was Hall's fault. So, they did these people just really believe that Hall disappeared with the Mosquito King, found the promised land of Poyers and came back and said, sorry guys, it doesn't I exist mean, as if he was going to keep the land for himself. I have no idea. I don't. Do you know if, I mean, do you know what happened to Hall? Like, did he, spoiler alert, he's not really related to me. <laughs> do I you don't know. <laughs> I don't know what ended up happening to Hall. I, this is the last we hear of him. I don't think he was indicted or arrested. So he didn't make it back to England with the other mm, 50 survivors or whatever. I don't Pledge allegiance to the Mosquito King. I'm not 100% sure on that. Employees. But part of it is McGregor, upon their return and all of this media attention, he insists that he himself had been defrauded and alleged embezzlement by some of his agents and claimed that merchants in British Honduras had undermined the development of Poyers because it threatened their profits. <laughs> and he had allies that vigorously denied the claims that Poyers did not exist and issued libel suits against British newspapers. So there was a huge... I mean... If you get enough people to lie hardcore enough for you, like people really start to wonder what really is the truth. And I think him and his allies did a great job of making it super doubtful. And I think a lot of people get to this point. If you lied so thoroughly for so long, you start to wonder like if your thing is a lie, because who would be that brazen? Who would be that bold? Yeah. And it's easier to play the victim in this situation to make it seem like, yeah, it's not his fault. He, he had all this perfect right. and someone else messed it up. So he basically gets away with it for now. He's done all of this terrible stuff to these settlers and frauded people out of, out of a lot of money. It's worth mentioning that during all of this, the South American bond market had started to crash after it was uncovered that the Colombian bonds were overvalued. So people started selling them and they became less valuable. And while legitimate countries bonds were able to recover Poyers just kind of died out so his profits went away he mm -hmm. stopped making money he didn't have any any money left so he flees to paris where you'd think he'd hide out but instead <laughs> instead mcgregor persuades the compagnie de la nouvelle nustri a firm of traders who focused on south america to seek investors and sellers for Poyers <laughs> in france he does the same thing he goes there and starts right back over and at the same time, he starts reaching out to the king of Spain in an attempt to make Poyers a Spanish protectorate, which is essentially a territory. He offers to lead a Spanish campaign to reconquer Guatemala using Poyers as a base. So he's, I, I, I kind of get the sense that at this point, he's grasping for royal straws, like trying to get somebody <laughs> to legitimize his country. Yeah. And he eventually succeeds in France to a good degree. He negotiates a sale with the French trading firm of five hundred thousand acres of Poyer's land which basically is an attempt to distance himself from the fraud he hopes that if he sells this land he can place the blame on the scheme on the trading company while claiming that he only provided the land i just sold it to him right he technically doesn't own the land anymore though right did no mosquito the, king the, take it the away mosquito king <laughs> took it back i mean he probably doesn't know that because so, he's been in europe the yeah, whole time but. so he <laughs> And this is kind of one of the things that, like, this couldn't happen today because we have instant verification. You would call right. the Poyer's King or the Mosquito King. And now it takes days for letters to reach here and there. And, like, people aren't informed on what's going on on the other side of the world. 
And he actually did try very hard to make sure nobody in Latin America found out about all of this because <laughs> nobody in Latin America b- knew that there was Poyes. There, there, there wasn't, wasn't Poyes. <laughs> so, incredibly, the company readies a ship at Le Havre and begins gathering French emigrants, 30 of which already obtained passports to travel to Poyes. <laughs> He's doing it again. The French government ends up becoming suspicious when an additional 30 requests were made for passports to a country they never heard of. At that time, two of McGregor's associates were arrested and the ship in Le Havre was ordered to be kept in port. The settlers gradually dispersed, becoming suspicious themselves. So the French are a little bit less gullible than the British at this point, thankfully. McGregor goes into hiding, though after three months, ends up being brought to La Force Prison in December of 1825, and that's a prison in Paris. The managing director of the trading firm that he worked with, a man by the name of Lehubi, went into hiding in the Netherlands. In an attempt to associate himself with the independence movement in Latin America and declare some sort of diplomatic immunity, McGregor publishes a declaration from his prison cell stating that he was, quote, contrary to human rights, held prisoner for reasons of which he is not aware and suffering as one of the founders of independence in the new world, end quote. So he's still playing the victim. Here. Yeah, he basically made himself into like a fake Latin American revolutionary that's being captured by the French. He's a martyr. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like the classic, I don't even know if this can be said it's classic, but it's like a lesson in if you're lying and you get caught, just keep lying because eventually no one will find out somehow. I don't like at the risk of making this joke again in the episode, it's kind of like the last four years in this country. Oh, it really, like, he just, yeah, I mean, he just covers up lie after lie after lie with bigger lie to the point where it's almost like, I don't know, societal gaslighting where you start to question, like, am I wrong? Are the newspapers yeah. wrong? Like, does he really have this country? Because nobody would be this bold. It's fake news. So he writes this. Unfortunately for him, the French government and the French police ignore the declaration. Ending up at trial, McGregor and the two associates were acquitted on the basis that they could have been defrauded themselves by the president of the company, Lehubi, whose absence seriously hampered the prosecution due to his having most of the incriminating documents with him in the Netherlands. They were all three released. Days later, French authorities arrested Le Hubi, and the three men learned that they would have to again stand trial. It's unfair. It's injustice. Due to a delay by the prosecution, McGregor and his lawyers had time to write out a 5,000-word statement that was read at trial that described the Scotsman's backgrounds, activities in the Americas, and his innocence regarding any attempt at fraud. And this basically ends up working. He, the, his lawyers read this 5,000-word statement. The company president, Lehubi, was found guilty and served 13 months in prison. But McGregor and the other two conspirators are released. Found not guilty. Charges dropped. So he's still running the streets. Not found guilty of anything. So, naturally, he returns to London, <laughs> where the attention to the Poyer scandal had died down. Incredibly, many still believed his claims of defraudment and embezzlement by his own agents, and the full extent of his scheme was yet to be uncovered. Many still believed Poyes was a real country, and despite being arrested and sent to prison for a week, he was released without charge. So they still, like, I don't know how much they knew at this point. I mean, obviously they knew that the settlers landed and had nowhere to go, but because of all of the, the blitzkrieg of lies and, you know, counter lies and all of this, Nobody really knew who was at fault, who had defrauded who, and he went free. There's got to be some element of media involvement in this. Just the fact that because the media outlets that are reporting on this aren't anywhere connected to... Like, they know as much about Poyes as anyone else in the country does. And that's basically just whatever McGregor told them. So, like, they, they aren't able to really go there and check it out for themselves and report accurately in the way that from our perspective, our media is all over the world and can check things out and verify them really quickly. So there's legitimate distrust in what the media says. And you kind of want to, if you're 
an average citizen in England this time, you almost want to trust the guy who's been there and the guy who says he's right. from there. So well, it's kind of understandable why there's so much confusion. Yeah, I mean, if you think about where we got the information from at this time, like the settlers coming back and the letter sent from British Honduras or from Belize were the only two indications that Poyais didn't exist. Now, he's already claimed that British Honduras, which is Belize, is trying to foil Poyais for their own financial benefit. So now there's doubt there. You can doubt that. The settlers return, and in a lot of ways, I think you could lie your way around that or make a story up about how British Honduras and the Mosquito King kind of like, in, you know, interfered in that plan and like they didn't let them develop. So it clearly worked. Some of the settlers didn't buy that McGregor screwed them. Like, and they thought Hall was, I don't know, trying to trick them out of something. <laughs> So clearly he's still like, there's a lot of doubt surrounding whether yeah. or not he did anything wrong. Even after trying it a second time in France. Maybe we're framing this wrong. Maybe he was the hero and we're trying to make him seem like a liar. I don't know. History, history pretty much agrees that he, he did this. Incredibly, after returning to London, he starts to attempt other less ornate schemes regarding Poyers. He continues to offer the bonds, but... Unfortunately for him, due to an anonymous handbill that was circulated throughout London warning readers and traders to avoid the bonds, they failed to become popular. The investors distrusted the bonds not because the full extent of McGregor's fraud had been discovered, but because the prior returns were less than expected. That's fair. <laughs> they didn't know about the fraud. They were just like, you know what? We didn't make 6%. I want something different. <laughs> By this time, the brother of the Mosquito King, Robert Charles Frederick, had succeeded him as king and began offering his own certificates covering the same territory to lumber companies in London. And this directly competed with McGregor. Other schemes popped up around London trying to sell Poyasian land. And soon, the attention and thus value of the bonds was virtually non-existent. The last known bond was sold by McGregor in 1838. So were there other people besides McGregor trying to sell these Poyasian bonds then? Eventually, yeah. I mean, like they basically followed suit. Yeah, yeah, they just followed so suit. Funny. And this d completely devalued them. It, I, I don't have a super big grasp on bond sales, but I guess it would be akin to like... I don't even want to compare it to this because it's not a great comparison, but like everybody pushing a game, the GameStop thing. Like one guy pushed it and it worked and then a whole bunch of people push it now that everybody knows about it. Mm -hmm. And now people just start to not care because everybody's doing it. I almost wonder if like, and maybe if for we somehow have any UK listeners that want to send us an email about this, but like, is the idea of Poy Poyes like this mythical country that still kind of exists in the lexicon of English? Yeah. Like, I don't know, England. Uh, that, I mean, the idea of this fake country that you can buy stock in or whatever. Yeah. Cause I don't know. I feel like we have those types of things in our culture, but they've just been so repeated and modified over right. the years that they're almost like a real thing. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that it's a, like a lexicon thing, but I will say in attempt to make myself more educated on the whole bond sales thing at this time, I found an article published by a UC Davis professor about South American bond sales in early 1800s it wasn't about Poyes, but Poyes was mentioned <laughs> it literally i mean it said like colombia peru chile brazil and the fictional country of Poyes. like <laughs> he i mean they were one of the early examples of bond sales in latin america so if nothing else this was i mean it was a huge economic deal at the time and there's actually lots of like if you're interested in this kind of stuff like the early stock market it's really interesting to look up like the, the, the beginning of it before we had computers and instantaneous information because you can learn a lot about, I, I guess, the basics of how the emotional, psychological side of the stock market works by learning about mm -hmm. this stuff. Because there's, I mean, even looking up things like the Dutch tulip trade and how people responded to tulip bulbs that turned into a bubble it just has helped me understand like the housing bubble, which makes less sense yeah. to me on the surface. But it it's kind of interesting how volatile and and almost fake like there was no value there right. was no poyes it didn't exist and people still were willing i mean he got sometimes on the, to the tune of three hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollar investment loans from people based on this fabricated story <laughs> so eventually the bond com becomes 
pretty low value. And like I said, the last one was sold in 1838. That same year, McGregor's wife, Josepha, dies. And almost immediately after her death, McGregor left for Venezuela, where he settled near Caracas in 1838. He applied for Venezuelan citizenship and being viewed favorably due to his involvement at the beginning of the country's fight for independence, his application was accepted. He was granted a military pension and lived the rest of his life in Caracas, becoming a favored member of the community until his death seven years later in 1845. He was buried with full military honor and obituaries in Caracas extolled him as a war hero and a valiant champion of independence. Well, good. We have a happy ending for our hero. What? He this is the biggest fraud ever, and he just gets away. I can't believe that, like, I, I really wish I could find more information on why nobody brought this up later. Like, I feel like today the FBI would have a worldwide watch list and have you, like, they'd find you in Caracas or wherever. I mean, okay. I get that they didn't have the FBI. but Yeah, but once he gets out scot-free, pretty much, he moves across the ocean to venezuela right. yeah, I mean, and at that does. point he's not hurting anyone and who's gonna bother coming looking for him i right. guess it's obviously not a good thing but it, the court of law already viewed him as innocent in this yeah and why chase Just him to crazy. Venezuela? It, it's almost like jing shi that we talked about got away with <laughs> right all this crazy illegal stuff and made a fortune on it and faced absolutely no yeah. penalties <laughs> so one interesting question i want to ask to wrap up do you think he succeeded in his ultimate goal of becoming this respected, noble socialite? Because I think that was his goal, was to, to, to be... Yes. Uh, yes. Yes, because even though it wasn't the smoothest of roads, obviously spent a little bit of time in jail and faced some trials and things like that, the fact that his influence convinced people to believe that he <laughs> was innocent in this and blame other people for the complete yeah. mess it turned into shows how important people viewed him and this like they trusted him and believed that he was this important person and then he ends his life in another country where he's extolled as a military hero and <laughs> <laughs> a valiant champion of independence like he <laughs> clearly Succeeded, succeeded yeah, yeah. <laughs> whether or not he went about it the right way and was it yeah him being successful in establishing this prominence and this title and whatever he aspired to doesn't mean he was a good guy well no i that's <laughs> i think for me at least is a pretty much decided no for me as far as being a good guy but but yeah i mean i think he okay it sounds like this guy wanted a life of adventure and influence and wealth and i think he got that yeah ready for your quiz yeah i think so i can't imagine what it's gonna be about it's gonna be difficult <laughs> great we'll be right back All right, it's time for today's quiz segment of our show. We like to end every episode with just a short three-question quiz to kind of test today's host and his knowledge of the topic. And maybe you, the listener at home, know a little bit about it and want to follow along and see if you can get these right on your own. Are you ready? Yes, I am. There's not like a specific topic to this episode. It was hard, I think. I guess like con artists, but like, I don't know, just kind of... <laughs> Tried to find questions that were sort of around the topic. Yeah. So this one might be a little challenging, but I think you'll do okay. Your first question. You talked a little bit about McGregor's military experience, but I think to focus on the uh, actual con, you skipped through some of it. Mm -hmm. But while McGregor was in the Florida territory, he invaded what's called Amelia Island. And Amelia Island is a part of the present-day state of Florida. But in its history, it's been ruled by several nations since the first European explorers landed there in 1562. So in total, eight different flags have flown over Amelia Island, including McGregor's Green Cross flag mm -hmm. and the current present-day U.S. flag. Can you name the other six flags oh, that have flown over Amelia Island? I would imagine the Spanish flag. That's one. I kind of feel like the French flag. Two. 
Portuguese? Nope. Mm. <laughs> the Jolly Roger. <laughs> Close, but no. <laughs> no. Dang. Um, Jamaican flag? Cuban flag. No. Any Caribbean country flag. <laughs> okay, so it was first the first explorers to kind of land on Amelia Island were the French. So you okay. got that one. And it, like I said, it changed rule a lot during different military times. So it went from the French to the Spanish. Uh, Spanish were in and out a couple times in its history. The British at one point. Hmm. Oh, that was dumb. When the island was first kind of taken on by American troops, but before Florida was a state. They mm-hmm. had what was called the Floridian or Patriot flag. So I don't really expect you to get that one. There's but, no way I would have ever got that. Uh, it was also then taken over by the Green Cross flag. Uh, eventually, at one point, the Mexican flag. During the Civil War, the Confederate flag flew above uh, Amelia Island. And then today, present day, the United States flag. That was difficult. That was That's good. probably your hardest question. No, but I, I could have guessed probably the Confederate and the British flag pretty easily. I thought Mexican, but I was like, I don't think Mexi- the Mexican flag got that far over. But. Uh-huh some Guess point <laughs> question number two the land granted to mcgregor and claimed to be poyes was eight million acres which you mentioned was larger than the country of wales eight million acres is closest to the size of which u.s state i can make mm. it multiple choice if you want it to be multiple choice i'm trying to think of like i feel like it's bigger than rhode island just want to give U.S. state reference for most of our American listeners to kind of get an idea of how much territory McGregor, yeah, quote unquote, just ruled kind over. Kind of picturing, I looked at the map today, and the area looks like it was bigger than Rhode Island, probably bigger than Delaware. I could see Connecticut, and I could see Massachusetts. I, I feel like New Jersey's too big, and I kind of feel like Massachusetts is too big. So I'm going to go with Connecticut. Incorrect. Dang. It was very close in size to the state of Maryland. Oh, dang. Maryland's not that big. I should have. Maryland's bigger than all the ones that you mentioned. Really? Yeah. Maryland is about 7.94 acres. So I guess it was was actually slightly larger than the state of Maryland, which is pretty. It's bigger than everything. Yeah. I mean, it's it's near the bottom as far as sizes of states, but like. Obviously, yeah. the Western states are a lot larger. So Maryland's a decent-sized state. Yeah, That's a good chunk of land that he was the prince of. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of land. All right, your final question. The common term that we hear a lot today for an investment scam is called a Ponzi scheme. Where does the term Ponzi scheme come from? Uh, I feel like it comes from the name of the guy who attempted it, but I don't remember his first name. I also could be completely making that up. But um, that, that's, a, that's the answer I'm going to give. It's kind of half-assed, but... Yeah, I mean, you're right. Is it Michael Ponzi? <laughs> Charles Ponzi. Charles Ponzi. But he was born Carlo Pietro Giovanni Guglielmo Tebaldo Ponzi. I'm so glad you pronounced that. That made <laughs> me feel so much better about mine. He was an Italian con artist, but he performed his scheme i guess in the united states and canada mostly so what he did was he promised clients a 50 percent profit within 45 days or 100 percent profit within 90 days by buying discounted postal reply coupons in other countries and then redeeming them at face value in the u.s so basically he was taking people's money to buy these postal reply coupons and never actually doing that he would take their money and use that money or he, he would take their money, collect it, pool it, take other investors' money, and use the later investors' money to pay the quote-unquote dividends, so profits to the first people, Yeah, and then continue to take future investors' money to pay off the earlier investors. And he actually was very successful at this. Yeah. He's maybe not the most successful scam artist, con artist, but... Who just did that? I keep trying to think of his name. Bernie Madoff. Thank that you. was the big recent one in the yeah. early 2000s. But yeah, he, he, he did this for over a year before it eventually collapsed and cost his investors uh, about $20 million, which Jeez. in today's money is more like $250 million. Wow. Bernie Madoff was like billion dollar, multi-billion dollar yeah. sca- scheme. Well, I mean, theoretically, so. not legally, but theoretically it works until you it can't doesn't. find somebody to cover the next level. Yeah. It almost reminds me of like the, the strategy of doubling your bet in Vegas. 
Like if you on roulette always choose red and you keep doubling your bet, theoretically you can always make your money back. But if you get to a point where you can't afford to make the next double bet, which is super likely if you keep doubling, yeah. it eventually gets to an enormous amount of money, you lose. So it's kind of like a similar idea where you mm-hmm. have to keep doubling down until you can't double down and then you're screwed. So what we're saying is we don't recommend trying to start a Ponzi scheme <laughs> because it doesn't work. And, well, it does work, but only to a certain point. And Eventually you'll go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're granted a plot of land in an exotic country where no one's ever been and you can go back to your home country and sell people investment bonds and plots of land and whatever, absolutely please do that. And contrary to our previous conversation about lying, if you're going to lie, best just keep lying with bigger and bigger lies because <laughs> eventually someone will believe you. <laughs> and just stick to it. Just keep lying. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening. Today's episode has been a lot of fun. Uh, we hope you learned something. I definitely, as as the one who researched all of this and saw the sheer amount of information out there, if you found this episode interesting, definitely research Gregor McGregor because we probably covered like five to 10% of the total amount of information out there about him. And his story is super interesting. And this is still one of our longer episodes. Yeah. <laughs> so but we established his, that's his real name, right? Gregor McGregor. Yeah. Yes, it is. That's terrible. It's, it really is. <laughs> that's the first thing he should have done. If he wanted popularity, change, <laughs> change up the name. As always, thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate your support and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. History's B-Side is an independent, listener-supported podcast. Leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service. And follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at History's B-Side. Send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at historiesbside at gmail.com. You can donate to the show at buymeacoffee.com slash historiesbside. While you're there, check out our membership perks, merchandise, and more. This episode was researched and produced by your hosts, Matt Melito and Phil Hall. Thanks for listening to History's B-Side.